Hello again, welcome back to week 38 of year 4 of the Religious Education Initiative. This is day 2, and we're talking about the repentance of St. Constantine, because on May 21st we celebrate the feast of St. Constantine and Helen. Uh, because of that feast this week, then, we're going to do something a little unusual and read something from a living author, not because the author is a saint, but because his words reflect the Church's perspective on the sanctity of kings and on their repentance. It's especially fitting that we read this as we are also considering the life and the sins of King David. So This is by Archimandrite Meletius Statius. It's a translation, not mine. The very name of Constantine is enough to move the heart of any Greek Christian, not only today, but for many years now, because it is associated with the legends of the nation, with once again, with the passing of years, and in good time, it will be ours again. It moves us because the first to bear the name Constantine was not merely one of the greatest men in world history, but he was something more besides. He was a saint. And when they hear the word saints, the trumpeters of atheism and unbelief start to sound off. Is he a king and emperor? Yes. Great. Yes, but saints? No, he's not a saint, they say. Because, they say, Constantine the Great committed crimes. He killed his son Crispus. He killed his second wife Fausta. And so he shouldn't be considered a saint. What can we say in response to those who are against Constantine the Great for no other reason than that he was a Christian? Had he not been a Christian but an idolater like Julian the Apostate who betrayed the church, then they would be praising him. But no, Constantine, who supported the Orthodox faith and established firm foundations, is slandered and hated by the enemies of Christ. We would answer, they either forget or do not know that in our faith there is a great thing called repentance, one tear from a sinner whatever act they've committed, one tear at the sacrament of confession redeems any fault. Were there no repentance, paradise would be empty. We wouldn't have a calendar of feasts nor any saints because there isn't a saint who hasn't wept and hasn't repentant of sins. There is no other way to paradise, beloved, than the door of repentance. Constantine wasn't born a saint. He became one. He made mistakes, but he repented. Let us not forget that he was brought up in the inhuman surroundings of the courts of Diocletian and Galerius, yet he disagreed with people like them. He is a saint because his presence in the world is the light of Christ. This light is also shown in his call, which is remarkably like that of St. Paul, and which is why it is mentioned in his dismissal hymn, his Apolitikion. St. Paul was called by Christ in a vision when he was walking along the road to Damascus. He saw a shining light and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In the same way, St. Constantine was called in a vision, a historic vision which is, which is reported by contemporary historians. What was the vision? When he arrived outside Rome on October 28th in the year 312 A.D., the army of his rival was three times larger, and defeat stared him in the face. As he sat there pondering in broad daylight, he saw a great sign. The stars in the heavens formed a cross, and below the cross he saw the words, In this conquer, in hoc winces, or uh, uh, um, en tuto nica. And from that moment on, he was convinced that the future of humanity rested with Christ. He then adopted the banner which preceded his troops, and with this sign, in this conquer, he defeated Maxentius, entered Rome, and proclaimed to the whole city that this victory did not belong to his legions, but to the honorable cross. His edicts, his edicts are light. The first edict in February, 13, uh, in February 313 was for the persecutions to cease. Just imagine, the persecution of Christians had lasted 300 years. It was forbidden to be Christian. The very word Christian was cause enough for conviction. Nothing else needed to be investigated. Are you Christian? That was it. Possessions confiscated, incredible sufferings, horrifying tortures. How many martyrs? Twelve million. For three hundred years Christians begged, Lord, give us peace. And he did. Peace came into the world through the chosen vessel of divine providence, Constantine the Great. How then can we not honor him? We ought to do so if for nothing else than that edict which he signed with his holy hands. His nobility of soul and forgiving nature were also light. They say that some idolater enemies once decapitated a statue of him. When the news was brought to him, he raised his hands, took hold of his real head, and said, 
This is my head here. There's nothing missing. Don't punish them. On another occasion, he said that if he saw a cleric sinning, he would cover him with his robe so as to prevent other people seeing his sins. This showed his intense concern that the church should not be subjected to scandals. He abolished the worship of the Roman emperors who were once considered gods on earth. His legislation was also light. For the first time, Christian legislation was introduced. His vision was rare. What vision? To make a Christian state on a global scale and offer it to Christ for sanctification and deification. This is why he is depicted holding an orb. And just as the patriarch Abraham heard the voice of God telling him to leave his homeland and settle in a land that God would show him, so too St. Constantine left old Rome, the city stained with the blood of innocent Christians criminally killed, and built a new Rome on the Bosporus, which after his repose was quite rightly called Constantinople, the city of Constantine. And from here he took measures aimed at raising the spiritual state and the sanctity of the people. What measures? He closed all the nighttime places of corrupt pleasure. There were places of entertainment where women gathered under the protection of disgusting divinities, Aphrodite centers, Bacchus centers, and he closed them all. He closed the oracles and got rid of the magicians who were exploiting people and deceiving them. He forbade blasphemy. He said he would forgive anything except blasphemy. If anyone blasphemed the name of Christ, they were immediately arrested and exiled. He honored Sunday by edict. He declared it a great and splendid day and forbade any shops to close. Horse races, places of relaxation, everything closed. He supported small landowners and workers and took measures against usury and every other form of injustice. He was the first to support human rights. He protected widows and orphans and showed particular concern for social welfare. He protected the Orthodox faith. When Arius, the leader of the heresy named after him, came along and opened his dirty mouth against our Lord Jesus Christ and said that he was not really God and of the same substance as the Father, Constantine convened the first ecumenical synod in Nicaea in Bithynia to write the creed. He himself went to the gathering not as emperor and ruler of the inhabited world, but in humility and kissed the hands of the holy bishops, many of whom still had the marks of their mistreatment from the tortures of the persecution fresh on their bodies. Not being a theologian, when he was asked for his opinion, he replied, I respect what I do not know. He supported missionary work. It was during his time as emperor that the Armenians and Georgians became Christians, and the light of Christ reached as far as India. It was at his command that the honorable cross was found and the first churches were built in Jerusalem. He was the initiator and founder of a Christian empire that lasted 1,100 years. Finally, beloved, when he realized that his earthly end was approaching, he surrounded himself with bishops and confessed his sins and wept. He was then baptized at the age of about 63 and never again put on the royal robes, the splendid imperial vestments, but wore only his white baptismal robes, telling people that he now really did feel like an emperor. He took communion, the body and blood of Christ, and pure and clean, rejoicing and praying, departed for the heavenly kingdom. Beloved, even if we ignore all the above, there are two criteria for the Church regarding his sanctity, the first being the vision of God and the grace which the saint enjoyed, and the second, his miracles after death. After his departure from this life, his sacred relics were buried with imperial honors in the narthex of the Church of the Holy Apostles, where they gave off a powerful fragrance and myrrh and performed many miracles. It may be that some people wonder whether what the Christians say is really the truth. Beloved, even if some people don't believe, there are two criteria for his sanctity, and only two. It is with the seal of God that Constantine is a saint and equal to the apostles. History has shown him to be great, and the church has shown him to be a saint. And then we also have an added note about the murders of his family and the explanation, the backstory. The truth of the matter is as follows. When Constantine the Great was Caesar in the West, Rome proclaimed the cure the cruel anti-Christian Maxentius as emperor, who, wishing to cover his back in the West, since he feared Constantine, forced him to divorce his wife Minervina and marry Fausta, a very ambitious and cunning woman who was also Maxentius's sister, in order to control him. When she saw Constantine's eldest son, Crispus, distinguishing himself in battles and being groomed for the succession, 
She wanted to destroy him at all costs, in order to promote her own three sons to positions of power. So she slandered Crispus by saying that he had tried to rape her and kill his father in order to seize power like a new Absalom. Unfortunately, Fausta's plan was so convincing and her lies so persuasive that Constantine and the generals fell into the demonic trap, and they allowed Crispus to be put to death in accordance with the law. When the Queen Mother, St. Helen, who was many miles away, learned what had happened, she rebuked her son severely for his decision. Constantine instituted exhaustive inquiries from which it became clear that he was the victim of a criminal conspiracy on the part of his wife, Fausta, and her supporters. So he ordered that she too be put to death. These two murders of people of his own family greatly distressed Constantine, and he regretted them bitterly to the end of his days and sought God's forgiveness. In order to show his repentance publicly, he had a statue erected to Crispus with the inscription, To my much wronged son. So, I'm not going to comment a lot about this. It's a longer reading anyway. But this reality of, of St. Constantine is an important thing for us uh, as Orthodox Christians to reflect on, as we consider the life of King David as well. Because we do not honor the saints for every single thing that they did, what we honor in them, what we venerate in them, is God's work of healing, of which we see in their repentance, their laying aside of their sins, and the transformation of their life. Both Constantine and David were men of power, men of war, men who could seize whatever they wanted. The marvel and miracle in their lives is not that they seized what they wished, it's that having gained all that the world could give to them, they turned in repentance and, cl and held fast, first of all, to the Lord and Savior of our souls. So, through their intercessions, may we find repentance and salvation. Amen.